started off in investment management, so that was about 20, some 20 years ago. Um, and as you can imagine, too, I'm originally from London, so um, so that's where I schooled and um, basically had all my formal um, career um, with large asset management companies as well as some boutique private equity firms. I also went through the hardcore training of being a CFA charter holder and a Kaya charter holder. It dawned on me that, hey, to be able to create what you need, we need to create, you need to bring that understanding, the fundamental understanding of the industry, how we create portfolios, how we think about investment and mesh that knowledge with the engineering aspect. Because of my strong domain expertise in financial services and I communicate that with the engineers, yeah, that we are able to create a solution that is very much suitable for the industry. Hello, everyone. My name is Amy Cisse. Welcome to another episode of Cisse's Collab Space. Today, I have with me Lydia Ofuru. She is the CEO and founder of Planar. Lydia, it is such a pleasure to have you with me today. It was an honor to meet you at the Techstars event, and I had to have you on the podcast. Thanks for joining me. Thank you for having me, Amy. Very delighted to, you know, talk about what we're doing, share my experiences um, for the audience, and just talk through you know, everything, anything, and everything that comes to mind. So, looking forward to spending, you know, for the next seven minutes or whatever we have here, um, and enjoying ourselves on the podcast. Yes. So let's start there. Let's talk about your startup. Well, so Planar is what we're doing is that we, we focus on private markets, right? And we're using AI to help private markets really in, um, generate intelligence much faster. What that means is that there are a lot of, it, it, you know, I would say, underlying themes that we are tackling. Private market in itself, they, when we talk about AI and the end application of AI within private market, we have to start with data estate. Right, which is very, very important. Um, data estate in private market is very, very fragmented. Actually, I think across every industry in itself, data estate that companies hold is superbly fragmented. It's worse within private markets because things are done or have been historically done in a very manual way. Uh, what do I mean by that? People depend so much on Excel. They get data. It goes into Excel. It sits in folders to the degree that you know, opportunities or each opportunity could potentially be set in like a, a folder for each opportunity. So if you have 30 companies, we're talking about 30 individual folders and that sits on its own. And then you have CRM systems, for example, that have got, you know, it's just tracking conversations that teams are having, but it's not syncing or talking to, you know, any other data source within the company. Um, at the same time, the opportunity to really discover under the radar elements about a business is not happening on the surface. You have to dig a bit deeper into private companies, into industries, into a lot of, you know, different data elements to make sense as to what is happening around the private company. So it takes a, an awful amount of time to get all these individual data estate syncing with each other, very much human in the loop. Um, and it's just, you know, from my perspective, it's just something that, you know, um, technology can resolve very, very quickly so the human can apply their expert intelligence on top of the data intelligence that they're getting to get the full outcome that they want. And so Planar is, is, is solving that whole kind of like, you know, um, uh, I was, I would say four major areas. We're looking at a data warehousing workflow and looking to remove more than 80% of that data wrangling problem for the customer. We're also looking at the deal intelligence workflow, which, we, you know, requires a lot of data input and there's a lot of processes there. Um, we're looking at a company intelligence workflow. We're looking at the large, the last endpoint, excuse me, which is the, um, the, what we call the investment committee reporting webinar, uh, which is also another insight that you get on, uh, on planar. Um, so in a long and short answer of it is, you know, the, the, the relevance and importance 
of planner is that it obviously helps the team to get to the point to get that intelligence that they want much much faster than what where they are right now so it sounds like there's going to be dashboards or some sort of easy interface to surface all that data up is that a correct assumption that that would be the, the right instant point actually so the, for, for, for that instant point, well, when we think about how companies would all like, um, team members will interact with it or will, will interact with planner, they're not so much interested in the back end stuff that we're doing, which is very, very critical. But the front end, uh, end point would be dashboard experience at this point where people can easily consume the data intelligence, um, that we've aggregated and accumulated on the company for that particular company. And then follow on from then on in the, in the near future state, there's going to be that natural language extraction or communication with that dashboard experience, um, for team members. So, but we have to start with the first bit, which is get the data right, get data intelligence, give it like a typical, um, dashboard experience that people are familiar with before we go on to the natural language extraction experience. So. Mm -hmm. So it's intelligently pulling up information for you. Is it um, looking at the individual user or use cases and how people are working in order to pull up what might be maybe financial information? Is that a correct assumption? Um, so what we want to do or what we're asking for companies to do, because, you know, you have to model the experience based on what is happening right now. And we're talking about financial services, right? So things are a little bit much tightly controlled and, and, and less so than, you know, more so than other industries. And so whatever the user is doing or however the user is interacting with the platform is, is that, that experience have already been defined and set by the function of the person, which comes from obviously the company's culture and the company's requirement, which also means that it, it controls, you know, you know, um, the input of real data into the environment, right? Because if you have, you know, every individual person inputting their own set of information into the environment, we are talking about a financial kind of large volume or large dollar amount volume, you know, um, transactions. You want to make sure that there's one true source of truth when it comes to um, the data quality. Um, so it therefore means that there's somebody controlling what type of data is ingested into the environment. But the individual extraction experience could be different. Um, if you see what I mean. So that the individual clients, you know, kind of like, you know, model or have a different view on their platform. And it's fine. There's some level of personalization there. Um, but when it comes to what's going on into the environment is, is coming from one true source, source of truth. So that there's consistency. 100%. Um, in the experience. 100%. Yeah. yeah. And you need to control that, right? You, you do, someone needs to control that, um, 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 given, given the amounts that we, we have here in, in question here. I mean, mid market private equity firms typically, their deal flow or their investment size is they're making an investment into a business. And it kind of like it's in the millions. So people are doing five million, ten million goes way, way up to one hundred million dollars, for example, for a business. High stake deal deals, right? So you want to make sure that, you know, compliance is accurate, data is accurate, and consequently all of that goes into the type or the level of intelligence or the accuracy of intelligence that you want. To be extracted from the, the platform. So, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Right. And so, what type of um, what type of users are using this app in the enterprise? So, I know you mentioned um, private equity firms, but do you work with um, like what's your ideal client um, right. that you're working with? Like That's size, right. see. Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, the way that we see our go-to-market strategy, we actually kind of like, um, I would say we're segmenting that, at, you know, as we grow, we cannot attack every, um, type of customer at once. And so at the moment, we know that the, the market is right within the mid-market private equity stage, which means, you know, mid-market size company, mid-market private equity firms, um, you know, investing in private companies, U.S. private companies, hardcore, you know, um, 
I would say, um, person shovels companies generating um, minimum ARR, so annual recurring revenues, anywhere between ten million dollars to five hundred million to one billion dollars. You know that kind of range, right? Um, and we know that there's a huge demand for one to really get intelligence around companies out in the market much faster. The other thing, of course, is that we have been operating in a market where deals have not been done you know, faster before. So there's a quite like a backlog of opportunities that are looking to be completed, which brings into the other sort of you know, pressure point, which is like speed is paramount. paramount. So most of these companies are looking to do things very quickly and get it done quickly. So we know there's a strong demand for a platform like Planner for this particular market. Um, we have interest and we have been um, having conversations around enterprise solutions. There the solution is a little bit different because here within the platform that we build in a Planner, there's a lot of AI tooling that we embedded into the platform. And so when we get into the um, enterprise level, the use case of planner becomes a little bit different where the application is now more around the AI tooling that is within the, the platform called planner versus the actual planner product, if you see what I mean. And so we, we kind of like start going now go to market to make sure that we address the opportunity that's currently in the market, you know, really, really quickly, faster, quick, uh, quicker and be able to service the private equity firms that are looking to close deals faster and then after that we go into the enterprise level solutions by providing the AI tooling that we have developed in house. And we develop the AI tooling specifically for the market. So it's not like a generic AI tooling product, it's an AI tooling product that have been designed to handle private market transactions. So there's a difference. Nice. And of course, um, I'm loving to hear all the use cases around how AI is being used these days. Um, there's mixed emotions about it, but I think in the tech industry, um, organizations embracing the use of AI to, you know, help them work more efficiently is is definitely important these days for sure. One hundred percent. And I just actually posted something on LinkedIn about I, I wish that everybody tuned in or. It's learning about how AI is being developed and being used. So I, I referred to uh, my post was about the fact that Databricks is having the Idea and AI um, Summit right now. There's a lot of things that people can learn from that. And I say this to say that most of the times when I speak with customers, their understanding is that you can take a very kind of big large language model and immediately plug it into your company and get outcomes out of it. It doesn't work like that. That's the reality of, of the situation. This is not like, you know, a magic kind of like miracle, you know, um, um, sort of performance here. There's a lot of work with that one needs to, what needs to do. So you cannot simply, particularly for financial services industry, you have to have a fine-tuned environment that is specific to the vertical that we're talking about, you know, ready, um, you know, to be accumulated within your company. And then that environment, so you think about stage one, there's a general purpose license model or AI model, right? Ready in the market, open source or private, whichever. The second stage that people forget about is that the, whatever model that you want to tap into needs to be vertically appropriate for your in industry. So financial services, you have to integrate with the vertically fine-tuned version of the large number model. If in healthcare, you know, similarly, you have to do that. And then the third stage is now that is uh, environment learning on your own data, right? And so there's a lot of education, there's a little bit of education that needs to happen, that people typically go from the first bit and immediately expect like miracle results and output on their own data. And it doesn't happen like that in reality. And then on top of that, the data estate is in a mess at the moment, let's face it. So there's a lot of things that need to be done um, before you see that output um, that you're expecting. So. Absolutely. And it's like, it's also the learning curve of how the company, um, how they function, right? right? And there's a transition in the way that they're working. And to your point, um, it's looking at the data to see where it lives. Right. And 
Um, sometimes we have to deal with data duplication across the agency, right? Right. And um, and just making sure that when you're feeding the data into a new system that it's getting, like you mentioned, real data that's going to give um, accurate results back for sure. Right. It's very, very important. And I kind of feel like people, people are missing that key element. <laughs> so that, you know, number one, the data needs to be accurate. It needs to be labeled properly. It needs to be recognized properly and it's arranged properly and then you know the SKBs and both will happen. Um but 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 that that is something that we need to sort of keep educating people on. And then the other aspect is around security that I want to highlight, you know, because there's that assumption again, you know, for better or for worse, you know, some of the incidents that we've had in the past with open AI at the beginning really doesn't help with um the situation when it comes to security. Um, but that's a very, 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 very critical point. So as you integrate in your data in that private open source environment, um, one needs to be mindful around, you know, what sort of security are you shaping around the environment that we've created for that particular customer? Very, very important. So your proprietary data remains your proprietary data. It integrates with your own, own version yeah. of oh. the vertically trained uh, model that you've acquired or sort of access to your planner, right? Um, and there's a, again some education there that needs to be happened when you think about compliance in teams and the assumptions that they have uh, with regards to these models. So, um, you know, the conversation is never ending, but these are all very, very important discussions to have um, with, with companies. So, you have this. A mixture of both worlds, it sounds like, where you're highly technical and you're also in the financial space. So how do these two worlds, fintech, come together for you? Like, what's your background and how did you get into this this world? Yeah, well, that's a very, I mean, everything just kind of happened um, and unfolded as, you know, one sort of, you know, uh, went along one's career. But I started off in investment management, so that was about 20, some 20 years ago. Um, and as you can imagine too, I'm originally from London, so, um, so that's where I schooled and, um, basically had all my formal, um, career, um, with large asset management companies, as well as some boutique private equity firms. I also went through the hardcore training of being a CFA charter holder and a Kaya charter holder, which basically took most of my life. I saw all that time, but what it did do for me is really help me to understand the financial services industry generally, but also when it comes to investment businesses, what moves the market, what moves the world, that sort of, you know, education. Um, so that was helpful, but eventually I always knew that I wanted to come out of the large corporate, you know, state and do something interesting. So in fact, when I did leave corporate, I launched my first company, which was like an extension of what I was doing in-house, right? And typically that's what happens. Um, there, there needs to be a kind of a gradual kind of like, you know, move away from what one's uh, original state was. Uh, and that's what happened. And then out of that, I was kind of like, you know, thinking about, hey, some of these things that we do, technology could be um, used much more effectively to solve these solutions. So I started doing my own research, and bef- and this was way before you know that the the the, the subject around large number models and AI became really really big. Um, I stumbled upon a paper that was written by Google at the time. It talked about bilat- bilateral encoders in translating text and giving you the outcome that you want, right? So that was the, my, that piqued my interest. But then it quickly sort of, you know, dawned on me that, hey, to be able to create what you need, you need to create, you need to bring that understanding, the fundamental understanding of the industry, how we create portfolios, how we think about investment and mesh that knowledge with the engineering aspect. And so in my team, what you have is, yes, I'm the product person because of my strong domain expertise in financial services, and I communicate that with the engineers, right? So the engineers are coding and, and doing all sorts of things, and, and together we are able to create a solution that is very much suitable for the industry. Um, so 
it's a long way to say that definitely the industry experience was very helpful. I moved over to a totally new sector technology, which meant that I also had to relearn everything, relearn, relearn, you know, and understand code when it's sitting in front of me and what code is doing, uh, and being able to, you know, communicate, you know, that engineering language and the technical engineering language that, that is required. Um, and it's been an exciting journey, I would say, because I'm somebody that always loved learning and discovering and going exploring and the adventure of, you know, getting and consuming new information and creating as well. So I think my personality, um, sort of, you know, measure the interest and the opportunity just unfolded itself along the way. Nice. That's pretty impressive. Well, thank That's you. Really it's really hard work. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and um, of course, love the accent when you mentioned you're from um, London and um, just the segue from uh, your transition to uh, the U.S. as well. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Talk about. So, um, you know, I think that it takes uh, a brave person to be open to just all the movement that you've been doing, right? From between different industries, different countries. Um, so that's definitely very impressive with just the mindset of I'm always learning, basically. Right, right. And you've got to adapt as well because the thing is the world is so big and there's a lot, there's lots, lots, lots that I want to do. I've not even discovered, you know, half of the places that I want to go to or do half of the things I want to do. But it does require that openness and adaptability when you go into a new environment. So even when I came to the US, I was in San Francisco for a bit. And then I moved to New York. Naturally, New York sort of, you know, aligns with the culture of London. So so that worked really well. But then the um the opportunity to come to Baltimore was presented to me when I was back by Textile. So and I had I knew nothing about Baltimore, <laughs> but my MD was like, "Oh, you're gonna have fun. It's very interesting." And I thought, "Okay, why not?" So I then packed my stuff in two suitcases, go on the train, and I came to Baltimore. <laughs> and and call me crazy or something like that. But when I got here, I thought, "Oh my God, this is a wonderful, uh, you know, city. There's a lot happening here. I'm learning a lot. People are very, very accommodating and very welcoming. So why not stay and build from Baltimore? Why not?" You know, so so that that is what we're doing right now, and who knows where we're gonna land next. But so far, I think we're situated here. We're very excited about what we're building, and you say in Baltimore as our base. So. Nice. So you gotta check out the restaurants on the water in Baltimore for sure. One hundred percent. One hundred percent. I keep discovering sort of new hidden places around the city. It's it's a wonderful city. Um, and of course, what Upset is doing to help, you know, technology companies get established here is wonderful too. So, yeah. And so you mentioned TechStars. Um, how has TechStars supported your business? Um, in, in a lot of ways. And I'm so happy that we got in. Uh, and, and, and I will say this, that it only actually takes one person when it comes to this whole VC and investing in business building. It only takes one person to, identify or see your value and the capabilities and help you ship it up, um, you know, and, and turn it into something greater. And I think that's what we did find in our MD, Adam Phillips, who's a fantastic, you know, coach and mentor and advisor to have. And so when we came into Texas, I mean, we had one singular idea as to, hey, we want to do this segment here and think about using the platform for so-and-so, but, you know, what Adam and the ERRs um, did for us is help us expand our mindset, right, um, and help us expand the way to look at you know, solving. Number one, understand the problem fully, that it's not just one element, it's not just somebody who wants to do a due diligence on the company, but actually there's a, there are a lot more aspects around it that we could expand into so that happened over the past three months. And, and then the second bit was what the, the, the value of Texas, of course, is helping you to build a business, right? So let's go down to the fundamentals of building a business. You need customers. You need to understand what the customers want. You need to be sort of talking to customers all the time so that you can build the product that customers want. As opposed to you sitting somewhere and building a product that you think 
customers who want and then raising money to completely sort of pivot, pivot, pivot. Um, they, I think the Texas model is that you understand the business that you're building, the business you are in and be able to build a sustainable, long standing business that will help and service your customers. So from that regard, it has been, it has been very, very useful expanding your mind, our mindset and then giving us the tools really to, to build a, a business that will be around for many, many years to come. So super grateful that we're going here. Good. So mm-hmm. you guys have talked about all the administrative work that a business has to do that has nothing to do with the technology and nothing to do with the product. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's critical, right? Because the money's got to be tight. Number one, you got to know the numbers too. Um, you got to think about, you know, most of the time you've got one singular problem they want to solve, but in conversations, you, you'll be able to identify linked problems that actually might not be the initial problem that you thought you were going to be solving for. So the linked problems expand your market, it expand your understanding of, you know, what you should be building. And that exercise that textiles take you through is very, very critical. I don't know if other sort of facilitators do do that, but I do believe that the conversation at the beginning, that classroom setting, let's map through the business, let's talk through the problem, let's talk let's talk through the customers that you're serving, um, that exercise which happens within the program is very, very critical. Because then you would you, you will find yourself, you know, creating a larger business basically that is scalable that and that which also aligns with, you know, the business of venture building. So Absolutely. Um, and I do like that approach of seeing what the client wants and mm-hmm. giving feedback early on to help you to kind of shape the way that you kind of sell your product. Right. And the way that you um, have them, the clients embrace the product as well. For sure. Yeah. Very um, critical. So, yeah. And then those discussions, like you mentioned, um, you gain insight that you would not normally get if you wouldn't have those conversations. Right, yeah. right, right. It's very, very important, you know. So, you know, so one of the things that, you know, we did through the program is being able to just ask people that we didn't know, right? So go out and look for customers that we didn't know about. Um, I had no affiliations with, um, you know, that were just kind of like foreign to me, put out a survey and ask people what they think about this. What they think about that, da, 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 you know, all of those elements, right? And we've had more than 2,000 private equity professionals do sharing their insight and sharing their thought processes. You know, that if we hadn't come through the program, I think that would be a bit difficult for me to sit down and say, I'm going to ask strangers about, you know, what they think about this and that. But the support and the direction and the coaching that came through the program helped me to be able to do that effectively. Out of that, you get so much insight, so much insight that helps with the product development, right? And so once you get like the service, then you, you have some, a, a really good base now to go into the customer interviews, which is like the one to one conversations with, you know, the people that you're selling to. And this is one of the, one of the things that I also do like the private equity firms around the Baltimore DC state because people were so open. Um, in talking to us, you know, people jump on a call, give us your feedback. This is a very honest feedback, right? So they're very, very candid, what they were looking for, um, what they suffer from with current solutions and are in the market and why the current solutions are not really fulfilling what they need to see happening. So all of this is happening in real time and you're having the conversations, you know, on, on a frequent basis. And you also, it's not like a one-shot relationship or one-shot conversation. So we then took that sort of, you know, uh, feedback back into onto the product map. We created a prototype. We took it back to um, the customers that we've been speaking with just to confirm that this is what they're starting to happen. And, you know, it's an iteration back and forth. But it helps us to create a really, really powerful product for the market, you know. so. Again, all of that coming through from the, the, the whole training of what textiles provide for founders when they come through the program. So. That's awesome. Mm-hmm. I feel like with 
um, starting this business that there's an area that you may not like as much or maybe a challenge or maybe a bit of a stretch? Um, for me, it was marketing. Um, mm-hmm. That was not my strong suit. I didn't really like it that much. Um, and now I'm getting more comfortable with it. So do you right. find that there's any areas there or everything is just flowing naturally? I think for me, um, you know, at the early stages, you basically find yourself doing almost everything as the founder and CEO of the company. And what I don't like doing is the admin part, you know, so doing all that kind of like the writing the reports and doing all the financial planning things, which takes a lot of one stone. I'm much more like a product and salesperson. So create a product, go out and talk about it, get feedback, iterate, you know, talk with engineers and things like that. That I love doing. But that boring advent part is like bored. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it's also very critical. So yeah. Yeah. So um yeah. Yeah. We we look into obviously um, you know, um hire more people with the round that we're raising. So hire more people. So some of these things can be delegated and I can sort of you know, shine in my positive kind of like places <laughs> and areas. So yeah. I completely understand. And, you know, even though, like, say, for example, I have someone that's maybe handling payroll or some other administrative processes as the founder, I still have to step in and we have to figure things out together and push through. So I definitely um, understand. And sometimes, mm-hmm. um, depending on the stage of your business, like you said, you're doing everything until yeah. you have enough revenue coming in so that you can um, pay people to do work, but then you have the responsibilities. I got to make sure I can keep paying them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I got to make sure yeah. I can keep money at the door, right? Yeah, 100%. So, yeah. <laughs> but it's all worth it. It's all fruitful. Yeah. So what are the next steps for your company? Well, we're very excited yeah, about building. We're now sort of in a building phase right now. So we're using the whole of the summer to build um you know, pass of the platform. Um, we've got a number of um, projects that are starting in Q4. So um, we, we, I'm very excited about that because it's like, you know, I love creating and seeing all the creation and everything come to life is a moment for me. Um, and the team are also very, very excited about doing that too. So we, we currently has down um, developing and building out. And of course, you know, looking forward to sort of Making certain announcements, you know, um, down, down later on this year. Um, I, th- I think once we tackle the data intelligence aspect, looking at the four quadrants, the four areas around data warehouse and warehouse and workflows, customer or, or company intelligence workflows, that I see reports and workflows and deal opportunity discovery workflows, uh, and, and dealing and getting that sort of, you know, the, the, the data bit to the data intelligence stage, I'm super, super excited to let them see the next thing that could happen for our customers, which is now being able to query some of this data intelligence in a natural language format. Um, that takes a bit of time, but it's like, it's exciting to see all the preparation work that we're doing behind the scenes that will be coming to the forefront, um, you know, the latest stages of this year or early next year. So, um, we, we've got a really big and great future ahead of us. Our product is filling a very, very big hole in the marketplace at this point in time. And, um, we, we, are, we, we remain excited about, you know, the value add, or the value that we add in to the whole industry. It's, it's a big market as it is. So, um, we can only kind of like, you know, help accelerate how big the market could be in the long run. So that's very exciting. Mm-hmm. And I wish you all the success in the world. How can the audience well, get in contact you. with you? You know, um, a couple of ways. We've got like a submission form on our website, planner.io. Uh, so if you go into our website, um, put your details in there. We'll come back right to us. You can also follow us on LinkedIn. Uh, we do a lot of you know educational posting and sharing of thoughts on LinkedIn. You search for Planner, P-L-A-I-N-R, you know, as a company on LinkedIn and start following us there too. Um, you know, that will be helpful. And then, of course, if you see us kind of like, you know, going or speaking at any conference, come and check us out, come to that conference too. But, you know, um, yeah, just keep updated with, you know, our content on LinkedIn and do reach out via our, our, our website. Excellent. 
it was a pleasure to have you here today. Thank you for joining me. Well, thank you, Amy. It was great to chat with you too. Thank you.